Hello, my name is Will Russell again, joined again for another video update by Dr. Jim James, who uh, is a retired Army general. He's also a, a former uh, director in the epidemiology world for the American Healthcare Association. He's an editor-in-chief of, uh, of a scholarly journal on epidemiology. And uh, joined today just to just give a quick update on kind of where we are. It has been a while. But uh, Dr. James, a lot of things have transpired since the last time we talked that tend, I think, to kind of move the needle uh, a little bit in the direction of the things that you've been talking about since as early as March. Uh, so we'll just start off um, here at the beginning with just a quick overall, you know, from a public health epidemiology standpoint, where are we right now in terms of this virus, cases, deaths, hospitalizations, etc.? And, you know, I could talk for an hour, you know, just on the numbers and the cases and the mortality. And the problem I see is we continue to measure the impact of COVID-19 based on new cases per day when the meaning of the number has changed significantly. Just to give you a, a, an arbitrary example, but it would hold true um, if you really diced the numbers. If you took a hundred people today and they tested positive, their average age would be 20 to 30. If you went back in March and you took those same hundred people, their average age might be 55 or 60. That's two different presentations, two different medical impacts. You can only see that medical impact if you look at hospitalizations, and mortality. It's important to measure the number of cases out there, but not to equate that to the impact of what we're seeing. Case in point, um, in the newspaper, and, and, and the papers love cases because it's a nice big number, right. and it tends to go up, especially with the return to school, et cetera. But I want to give you one example. It's not even in this country. Italy. We all know, months ago, Italy was the epicenter uh, for the world of uh, COVID-19. And they were seeing 5,000 cases per day. They were having close to 500 deaths uh, per day at the peak, looking at seven-day averages. Mm -hmm. You go fast forward to today, in the paper today, uh, Italy spiking, Italy is going back into more drastic uh, uh, interventions. Look at the numbers. Remember, the peak back months ago was 5,000 cases. Today, they're back up to near 5,000 cases per day uh, on a seven-day moving average. But look at the deaths. The deaths at that point were close to 500 per day, or 10%. Today, on average, they're less than 30. I mean, it, it, it's a whole different impact, and it has to do with so many factors that are not reflected when you simply look at the number of cases reported, which is nothing but a lab test. So uh, a lot of things have come out from folks who are big in the world of epidemiology and um, uh, public health and, and, and things along that nature. Governor DeSantis did a two-hour uh, um, interview with three of some of the smartest people, Harvard, Stanford, Oxford, um, you know, professors who have come out and, and really um, fired serious shots across the bow from a scientific standpoint of, lockdowns, these mitigation techniques, which you had just mentioned, uh, getting ready to go back into an Italy. Um, the WHO recently reversed course on that. Um, and of course, there's the Great Barrington Accord, which you are a, a signatory of. So uh, Absolutely. So, you know, with all those things, uh, do you see, is it the science finally catching up to common sense, or have scientists finally gotten uh, to look at enough data and do enough studies? on the, the measures, the virus itself, to kind of see that you know, maybe these severe lockdown measures are having uh, 
unintended consequences that are actually worse than the virus itself? I think there's been a small group of us from day one mm -hmm. who have felt that A, lockdowns were never demonstrated to have a positive impact. When the lockdowns were instituted and eventually uh, cases and deaths peaked, they took credit for it from the lockdown measures. Nobody can prove or disprove that. I think there are many, many countries that you can look at that did or did not use lockdown and come up with any conclusion that you want. I think what's incontrovertible is the collateral damage that we've done, economically, socially, especially to children. The case, uh, what we, the medical care that we've put off, the rising number of uh, mental health illnesses, uh, suicides, uh, we are so far behind now on immunizations in this country, globally. Uh, people with heart attacks wouldn't come into the hospital because the fear level of uh, COVID had gotten so high. I think in retrospect, when we measure the collateral damage of severe lockdowns and school closures, it's going to far outweigh the overall public health impacts of uh, COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Now, do you think that the WHO reversing course and the Great Barrington Accord, do you think that's going to... Um, turn the tide in terms of public policy and some of the measures that are being instituted. You said to yourself, you know, Italy's talking about going back into lockdown mode, even though the death rate is very reasonable. And uh, let's start with WHO. Mm -hmm. now, obviously, they're, you know, the elephant in the room. Uh, a lot of people rightly pay a lot of close attention to them. Uh, they've been a proponent uh, up to quite recently of lockdowns. I think their position now has changed. You don't do lockdowns as your primary measure. Mm -hmm. There are other things that work and probably uh, work better. And so I think they, if not totally reversed their position, they have certainly uh, uh, seen lockdowns in a more negative light. Why? They fully recognize the impacts on global health, secondary to uh, economic and uh, social upheaval. Uh, they more than anyone. And when you look at their predictions for increased famine, infectious diseases, uh, poverty, it, it, it is again, I think that side's incontrovertible. When you look at the Barrington uh, work, I, I, I'm just so happy to see that it's long overdue. I think people, I don't want to talk about myself because, you know, uh, uh, the work I do isn't in the limelight. But a whole lot of uh, individuals, not a whole lot, but individuals out there who have taken a stance that's more conservative, and I don't mean that politically, mm -hmm. I mean conservative in terms of the interventions, they've been labeled all sorts of things. You know, you don't care about people, you're um, you know, your conspiracy theorist, and, uh, et cetera. And what I feel best, uh, feel good about the Barrington thing is you're bringing together really noted uh, scientists, epidemiologists, uh, you're combining that with the observations and input from uh, literally hundreds and thousands of healthcare workers, uh, mm -hmm. et cetera. Uh, who, are, uh, rec who are recognizing that there are better approaches to controlling mortality and hospitalizations as opposed to lockdowns and school closures. And uh, we're all aware of those. And I don't think we should leave that question without addressing two other things that Barrington brings up. The absolute most important thing, we know the high-risk group. The high-risk group is over 60 or have coexisting conditions. 
that does not represent an overwhelming percentage of the population. Yet, our interventions have been spread across the whole population. We need targeted interventions. And I, I, I just can't understand why uh, people want to see uh, programs at a national or state level evenly uh, uh, put in place regardless of the risk to individuals in a county or a town uh, or a city. Mm -hmm. The other thing uh, addressed in Barrington, and, and it's something I've really felt strongly about, and it has to do with this whole thing of herd immunity, which to me is one of the most misunderstood things out there. People use herd immunity in two ways, that there is some level, some magic level that if you hit that, the disease is gone. That's really not what it's about. What it's about is building up the number of non-susceptibles, people who won't get infected because if they had a vaccine, they had a vaccine, or without a vaccine, they have immunity. Acquired immunity, crossover immunity, natural immunity. They have immunity to getting uh, infected uh, with uh, the COVID. As you build that number up, then the number of people that can become infected from an infected case gets lower and lower, just probability. What I'm trying to get at, if when this thing starts, I can spread it to two people, and I walk into a room with a thousand uh, people that have never been exposed and don't have immunity, I can cause quite a chain reaction over time. Uh, if I walk into that same room and 80% uh, are uh, immune uh, because of having had the disease or some natural thing, then my chances of running into one of the susceptibles is lower and lower. And eventually, as in 1918, the infection will run out of new people to infect. The virus isn't a smart virus. It's out there. If there's nobody for it to uh, infect, then uh, you've achieved with herd immunity. It's not something, I've said a hundred times, where we're saying we're gonna take a bunch of people and purposely expose them uh, to a pathogen. What we are saying is go about your normal life. Uh, if you become infected, uh, it needs to be addressed, but over time, uh, especially given the risk factor characteristics of age and uh, coexisting conditions, that most people should be able to lead a normal life. We should be able to open schools, open workplaces, open sporting venues, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So uh, what are you looking at for where we are right now moving forward? And uh, are you bold enough to make any predictions uh, for the rest of 2020? Uh, I, I think, yeah, I'm, I, I don't mind making a prediction and being wrong, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, what I do mind is when people take out their mathematical models, which are about like using a Ouija board and coming up with these guesstimates, uh, uh, I think based on the numbers, based on the curve, uh, I think the uh, case curve in the U.S. now is going up, it's not going up dramatically, it's probably going up due to schools, uh, colleges, etc. Deaths are flat. If anything, they continue to go down. So are we going to be in a situation by the end of the year that we have 500,000 deaths? I doubt it very much. I'm not gonna make a prediction on cases yeah. because the more you test, the more cases you're going to find. 
And, uh, but if you just look at that, uh, I would go in the uh, 250 to 300,000 uh, uh, level, uh, which is an awful lot of deaths, don't get me wrong. Nobody's underplaying the seriousness of this mm -hmm. for those who get it, especially uh, the elderly. But I don't think the um, I don't think the forecast that we've seen the gloom and doom forecast are going to come to pass. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you've talked to me a little bit about the golden standard of epidemiology, which I believe is uh, average life years expected. You know? Well, and how is that chart do you think going to be affected? Th that's an interesting thing. Very few people have looked at, but if you look at a, a chart of life expectancy, meaning uh, what is what can a person born in that year, how many years will they be expected to live, right. okay? Now, over time, our life expectancy has gone pretty much up, up. some minor glitches, HIV, HIV uh, World War II, uh, I mean, major events like that barely make a dent in it, okay? The only major dent in our life expectancy chart happened in 1918. I forget how many years life expectancy went down, but it was around four to five years, and that was the 1918 influenza. Now, getting to your question, what will the impact be this year? Uh, I would say it's going to be less excuse me, I would say it's going to be less than one, uh, more than 0.5, I, let's just 0.75, just as a mm -hmm. kind Not of back of the envelope. Like that. And uh, that's equivalent to a lot of other little blips that we've had. And again, a lot of reasons for this, but we shouldn't forget that 80 to 90% of deaths are occurring in people over 60. That's a lot different than when you're getting deaths with younger people who have many, many, many more life years ahead of them than somebody my age. And so when you do the tables and the numbers and the charts, the impact of a pandemic that affects young people is gonna be significantly greater than one that affects older people. Absolutely, and I would like to add one thing. Sure, go ahead. And we haven't mentioned vaccine. And uh, I, I think people are finally starting to realize that waiting for a vaccine, which will not be a silver bullet for uh, you know, getting rid of this, is kind of futile. Uh, staying indoors and locked down and everything, even if it worked, which I don't think it does, uh, for six months is having deleterious effects. It was implemented with the idea that eventually a vaccine would come and take care of that. How long are we willing to wait for that? Which goes back to the uh, herd immunity concept, why I think it's important uh, to build up our population immunity. I hope to heck we have a vaccine by the end of the year, but it won't have been designed uh, for old people. The only one that was even being designed for the elderly was the Johnson & Johnson one, and that was put on hold as of this morning mm -hmm. uh, with some problems. So what the Barrington folks say and, and people like myself are saying is we need to come to grips with this disease even if we don't have an effective vaccine. Well, Dr. James, I think that's a good place to end it, and I uh, certainly appreciate your time today, and uh, we'll hope to check back in sooner rather than later this time. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Thank you for watching.